The technology industry is built around the assumption that science and tech can solve many of humanity's biggest problems and overcome long-standing obstacles to progress. However, that narrative has been fundamentally called into question in recent years as systems like artificial intelligence and facial recognition have actually reinforced the racial divide and are potentially making the problem worse. Now what? Our guest today is Dr. Ruha Benjamin, sociologist, professor of African American studies at Princeton University, and the author of the book, Race After Technology. This book is a true deep dive on the impact of technology on race relations, and it also has positive prescriptions for how we can better design the systems of the future to overcome the current limitations and injustices. So Dr. Benjamin, could you talk a little bit about the book that you wrote and the responsibility that the technology industry shares on this important topic? A few years ago, I was on a sabbatical and I was working on a completely different project, looking more in, in the life sciences and population genomics. And I was noticing these headlines about so-called racist robots. There was like a first wave of headlines that was like, oh my God, how can robots be racist? And by robots, that's kind of like a heuristic for just automation and AI and technology more broadly. And then there was a second wave of stories that seemed less surprised, like, of course, technology inherits its creator's biases. And then slowly I started seeing a shift where people were grappling with the issues of algorithmic discrimination, machine bias and on. And it was more about trying to figure out how to create tech fixes for these issues. And so as someone who was trained in sociology and specifically the sociology of science and technology, I was noticing a kind of gap between these emerging conversations and this longer study and history of scholars and activists who've been thinking about the relationship between technology and society. Even going back to Martin Luther King, who warned about um, guided missiles and misguided men. <laughs> and so there is already mm. a kind of a seed of thinking about automation, the deadly underside of automation. And so I wanted to put this longer history of activism and scholarship in conversation with what's happening today. And we see how it's become more and more relevant, even just this week with all of the announcements of major companies pulling back their facial recognition systems from um, police and, and policing. And so I think it's just going to become more and more relevant for people to be thinking critically about our digital world. And so that's what my book is trying to bring to the fore of our conversation. Excellent. So there's this narrative that's been part of the technology industry for really the past couple decades that has just gotten called into question in the last few years, which is this idea that it is this force of, of change and this force of progressive um, values that we will overcome um, a lot of the challenges that have held humanity back in the past. And we've seen that narrative really get, get called into question in, in the last few years, especially around the, the issue of race. You mentioned um, the facial recognition where they're, because the people designing it um, are not diverse, uh, they have biases that maybe they don't have any um, unintended uh, consequences of uh, discriminating, but their own biases, their own um, uh, lack of uh, vision and, and a bigger vision has led them to design these systems that now are causing uh, a lot of challenges for people of color that then they get pulled over um, more, they get flagged for um, uh, uh, offenses more. And so it's reinforcing, if not making worse, what was already a system that was, that was difficult to deal with if you are a marginalized person, a person of color. Um, and so in your in your TED talk, and this goes back to 2015, um, it, you, you said at the heart of discriminatory design is the idea that we can create technological fixes for social crises. Mm. Rather than dealing with the underlying conditions, we create short-term responses that get the issue out of sight and out of mind. And so yeah. I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about that because I think that also, even though this is five years ago, it gets yeah. to the heart of exactly the, the challenge we're facing. Absolutely. And so what you described as a kind of um, backlash against the promises of big tech or what some people call the tech lash 
is in part because that narrative have, has been so powerful. You know, that narrative coming out of Silicon Valley that the technology is going to save us, right? We just have to allow the experts to figure out how to deal with it. But there's also another narrative that goes hand in hand with that one that has maybe been around even longer, which comes out of more of the, the Hollywood world, which is the technology is going to slay us, <laughs> right? Terminator. And yeah. so on the surface, these seem like opposing stories, right? One is it's our savior. One is it's we're going to devour humanity. It's going to take all the jobs. It's going to, you know, the matrix going to come back and make us batteries. Um, and so it seems like opposing stories, but under the surface, they share an underlying logic. That is that technology is in the driver's seat, that we're affected by it. It's either going to help us or harm us. But there's a third story, and that third story is what I'm trying to tell in Race After Technology, is that technology is not in the driver's seat. We need to pull back the screen, and we need to look at who's actually developing the technology and within what kind of incentive structure, what kind of ecosystem is technology being developed in. And the fact is, you know, much of our technology is being developed and conceived of by a small sliver of humanity. And this sliver of humanity has projected onto everyone else its own vision of the good life, <laughs> what it considers to be efficient, even, um, even unbiased as one of the promises that comes out of it, the neutrality of this, this particular population. And that is correspondent with the invisibility of whiteness and the hubris of patriarchy, in fact, when we think about, we know what's better for you than you do. And so I think what we have to do is to think carefully about this third story, who's behind the screen, and not only consider diversifying who's behind the screen, that's important, but it's not sufficient. Because if the ecosystem remains the same, if the context and the incentive structure in which that diverse workforce is developing technology remains the same, and by that I mean where the profit imperative trumps other kinds of public goods, then you can have as diverse a workforce as you want and you, we're still gonna get many of the same problems that we see today. And so when it comes to, for example, you mentioned facial recognition, you, that facial, first of all, the facial recognition systems don't work very well. And yet they're so bought and sold across our society and in every institution, not just policing. So what that tells us is that stuff cannot work and still be profitable. <laughs> That's the first thing. But the other thing is even if it worked perfectly, even if it didn't have all these false positives, most of which are false positives of darker skinned people, which is even more dangerous when we think about the current climate. But even if it worked perfectly, if it's operating within institutions that engage in discrimination, that are breaching people's privacy rights, then even a technology that works well is dangerous. It might be even more dangerous by working, by working well. And so part of what I want us to think about is not just focusing our attention on creating better technology that's less biased, that works better, but thinking about the entire ecosystem. What, is it, what would it mean to develop technology in the public interest for the public good? Not just as rhetoric, because everyone developing technology says, this is going to better humanity, this is going to save humanity. I mean, literally in the incentive structure, in the economic and social governance of technology, that we create an ecosystem that doesn't rely on the good intentions of an individual designer, where we say, oh, I hope they're looking out for the rest of us, <laughs> and then we sort of turn our back, yeah. but actually ensures that the stuff that's being developed is in service to the public good and the common good, and not the bottom line, not shareholders, not private interests that will continue to profit off of things like racism and sexism, which are currently built into the design of so many of our automated systems. And that would really have to happen at the individual level, right? It would have to happen at the level of um, leadership at, in, in some of these companies, as well as boards of directors and all, all of those things um, because we have these current very hierarchical structures you know th those companies reflect the hierarchical nature of our society and so is, is that what you're saying do you think that's the the um the i think that has a role to fix? play and what you're and so kind of like you're talking about the internal structure of companies the culture of these companies certainly 
yeah. as a role to play. But in some ways, we can't wait for that to happen because they're not. There's no incentive for them to really make these dramatic changes. We, we that's where the role of protest and public demand for certain changes, and also governance. Like, really, what does it mean to have public accountability that's independent of these companies? So we need the internal transformation. But we yeah. really need to think about what does a governing structure look like that's not as you know, corrupt as what we have in Washington now, but also not as self-interested as what we have in Silicon Valley. And so we need something that is um, apart from both of those really um, um, unsavory <laughs> ways of thinking about how to create a, a good ecosystem. So that really does get to accountability. It's one of the biggest parts of the narrative going on in the world today, you know, accountability, whether it's police departments or governments or um, all of those who are, are using their um, influence or power or, uh, you know, ways of, of working with people that are often um, not concerned enough with social justice. Yeah. yeah, I mean, accountability starts with even the very basic idea that we should know what systems are in use in our life, the systems that are making decisions about us that we don't even know about. Um, tomorrow, the city of New York is passing a bill that would demand that the, that the New York PD reveal its use of facial recognition, how it's been used, to what ends. The fact that you have to pass a whole bill just to get a public agency to reveal how it's using technology tells us that so much of this is shrouded in secrecy. <laughs> that mm. so, so uh, we need to move those veils out of the way because even before we can begin to question it, we just need to know what's actually happening. And in fact, in many areas of our lives, not just policing, in our employment context, in our hospital context, our educational context, those who are in charge have been adopting technologies, thinking it's gonna make things more efficient, thinking it's gonna make things more fair, and it's really just deepening and hiding the problems. And we need to bring all of that into the light right now. Excellent, so one more question um, for you, Ruha. Thank you so much. Um, let's talk a little bit about the effect of technology on jobs, because technology is transforming um, the job uh, market right out from under us and it's sometimes overlooked and it has huge effects. And what is the effect on that and in social justice and these types of uh, things? Because they obviously the jobs of, that are being created um, are often in, in technology and the jobs that are being eliminated are often um, jobs that are held by people of lower income that are sometimes at the most risk uh, and so would love your perspective on that. Yeah, absolutely. So there's two, two different ends of this that I think are important to keep in mind. One is this the basic idea when we talk about tech jobs, we often have in our minds the white collar jobs, the engineering jobs, the high paying jobs, right, is the reason everyone goes into STEM. But underneath that, there are a whole layer of jobs that support the tech industry that are tech jobs that aren't identified as such. For example, the armies of content moderators around the world, not just in the United States, who filter what we actually see on social media and in our digital lives, make it even usable. We wouldn't even be able to use these technologies because we would be so disgusted at what we were seeing if it were not for armies of content moderators who actually, in many cases, are traumatized by their work. And so there's a great um, documentary on Netflix called The Cleaners that are about the people who do this and a fantastic book called Behind the Screen by my colleague that you, you all should look up that really um, shows us this whole area of tech labor that we don't consider. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other is all of the kind of blue collar work, for example, Amazon warehouses that not only rely on these technology platforms, but then deploy it against their own workers, automating work, using algorithms to keep track of how fast people are producing that makes the labor even more oppressive than it already is. So that we know we have accounts of um, Amazon warehouses in Minnesota where the mostly Somali um, workforce have to hold up signs and protests that say, I am not a robot. <laughs> 
because they feel like their own flesh and blood is being automated. And so there's that deployment of technology back on the tech workforce. Then there's a whole other area that I think many people may start to relate to more, which is the way that even at the point of entry, when we're being hired for work, that process is being automated, that your interview is not even with a person, it's with a system that's now judging you according not just to what you say and how you act, but thousands of data points that's being compared to existing top performing employees in these organizations. So if, for example, many of these organizations have engaged in discriminatory employment practices, let's say for the last 50 years, that makes it homogenous according to race and according to gender, and you're being compared to them according to these so-called neutral data points, what's happening is that those same divisions, those same forms of discrimination are being reproduced under the guise of neutrality. And that's what I call the new gym code, because now you don't have a sign hanging in the door that says blacks need not apply. You just do your interview <laughs> online and then your, your posture, your vocal tone, your eye twitch, everything is being compared to a homogenous workforce and then your application is filtered out. So what I'm trying to say is that technology and employment, they intersect at so many different points. And what we have to do is rid ourselves, disabuse ourselves of the idea that technology necessarily makes things fair because often it doesn't. It hides forms of oppression and discrimination under the guise of this kind of progress that's technologically mediated. So we need to wake up. <laughs>